standing and reading, please, from the gospel, the, the gospel of John, chapter 14, 14. First three verses, let us honor the word of God and let us say thank you to the Lord for not only missing hell, but entering heaven. And that's irreversible after the rapture. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for heaven and Lord we know we cannot enter by our means through our means or trying to justify our life with the goodness in this world there is none good but God and we ask you to forgive us cleanse us and we ask you Lord to reveal yourself to us and so that we will be decisive Christians who, who say, I want to live a life that pleases the Lord and it is an honorable life unto the Father. Salvation is from the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Going now to the subject of heaven. What a comforting place of the word of God in the Lord Jesus saying, you know, he's the one, he's the mystery of godliness. Behold the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He added human, humanity, human nature unto himself. And he said... I came to replace you vicarious death, substitutional that is, death, death that was supposed to be punishing us. It punished the innocent, the Lord Jesus, the righteous, the Lord Jesus, the only man, according to his human nature, the only man that perfectly, perfectly, from birth to ministry, from birth to death, for 33 years and a half, the Lord Jesus pleased the perfect holiness and justice of God. And he walked in perfection. So he is the only one who deserves heaven. Amen. And he's the only one, the only one, think it this way. He's the only one that doesn't deserve hell. Yet, he dies a death that is owed to us. He, uh, we own, we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And he paid a debt we owe a, a, a debt we couldn't pay, and he paid a debt we couldn't pay. So, so he took our place, paid the price for salvation, and yet he took our place and that he is the only one who didn't deserve hell. All of us did. And all of us still do. After 40 years in serving and loving God Almighty, I still 
deserve hell. How about you? We all deserve hell. I'm not going to heaven because I deserve it. I go to heaven because he deserves it. And something about works. Every religion in this world other than Christianity is a works-based religion. Works-based. According to your effort and according to your goodness and according to your works, you can achieve salvation. But to the Christian, the evangelical Christian, the born-again believer uh, is a, a grace-based uh, salvation. We can say this way. We are saved by works, not ours. The Lord Jesus' work. That was a perfect work. Amen. So we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, in Scripture alone. Amen. So even we as evangelicals and uh, born-again people, we believe that salvation is not by works and we uh, and, and and we can and they cannot be meritorious meaning they merit it they deserve it uh, but uh, our works only count once we go to heaven and again the works we do after we are saved by grace alone, the works we do now will never be the basis of our salvation, even in heaven. We will always know that our salvation was because of His work and His sacrifice and not ours. The only thing that our works will do is to, um, is to crown us with uh, the, the different abilities in heaven and the different degrees of um, uh, renomination. It's something that the Lord is giving you um, as um, something... Reward. It's something that He wants to reward us with. So... Uh, our works count only for rewards, but not for salvation. Salvation, we're going to point to the Lord Jesus again and again in eternity. See how John Wesley's uh, theology uh, talked about two things, about God's communicable and incommunicable attributes. He called the one duration duration meaning eternity duration time duration duration without beginning and the other is duration without end duration without beginning this is God's attribute duration without beginning and then God also has duration without end but this part, duration without end, God communicates with us. That's why once we are born, once we are conceived, and we are eternal souls, we never cease to exist. But we didn't exist in the beginning. So the Lord has duration without beginning and duration without end. He doesn't share the first one, duration without beginning, but He shares with us duration without end. So, dear brothers and sisters, let us be really grateful to the Lord that He gives us duration eternal without end. And we're going to be with Him forever and ever, eternally grateful. In heaven, we're going to talk to each other and say, the Lord, our Savior, the Lord Jesus, the very center 
of, uh, of our salvation and redemption, the angels will rejoice about this sacrifice. The angels will rejoice about our salvation. Everyone will be singing a new song. Only the redeemed of the Lord can sing it. Revelation 14. Only a portion of the redeemed knew that song. You will see the Lord and he will become greater and greater. Each time, the Lord doesn't change. But as we get into the depths of God... He is becoming greater to us. It's not that God is greater a year after. It's because we have received this revelation that God is great. Amen. It's so powerful. There, is, there was another early theologian of the early centuries who said the, the, the following. How many of you uh, remember uh, Matthew 17 is the, uh, the story of the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus. And there is so much talk about the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 17. It's where uh, the Lord Jesus took uh, uh, Peter, James, and John, the, the closest apostle to him. And he went up to the mound uh, and there he was transfigured and light came upon him and he shone a light that uh, it's, uh, it's in 1 Timothy uh, 6.16 that says, God Almighty dwells in an unapproachable light. Amen. So part of this revelation came to them and they saw the Lord Jesus transfigured. See now the power in this. This theologian said, in fact, we can say, I, I, I don't say I'm absolute on that. I'm just saying it's a way to see things. The Lord Jesus was transfigured. But really, the Lord Jesus didn't change. He said that, in fact, it was not the Lord Jesus who was transfigured. It was the apostles that were transfigured. And they could see the Lord Jesus as who, tr he, who he truly was. That's a powerful truth. That's a powerful truth. They could see something deeper, something greater, something more luminous, something more powerful, something more Godly that they didn't see before this powerful light all of a sudden shone all over them. That's why Peter says, I don't want to go back to ministry. Let us build here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Let us stay here. Let us stay here. We, we, we can live under this light. We can live in this in this light, we will make uh, three tabernacles for you. We will be here amazed with your glory. But the Lord says, no, no. After that, you will go down and back into the world. And you will share the greatness of God Almighty. Amen. Remember the term ecclesia? It's twofold. One is a calling out of the world be ye separate, don't touch the unclean, and I will become your God. Second Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. Don't touch anything, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and my daughters, says God Almighty. Amen. But the other calling, except the ek kalo, calling out of the world, the other, the other calling is to call back you, the church, into the world and preach the gospel to every nation. Make disciples out of all nations. Out as regards to holiness, out of the world, but at the same time in the world with a mission. Amen. To spread that light of God. So the Lord Jesus says, 
Mitara sesto y monicardia. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't do it. Don't do it. This is prohibiting. It is something that is a com in a commanding voice. It is in the imperative. And um, whenever you see prohibiting uh, commandments of God, they are always protective commandments of God. Always. When God prohibits something, is to protect you from something. If you see it this way, then you say, Lord, let your conviction, let your direction come into my life. I welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I love the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You have no reason to be troubled. You, you believe in God. You believe also in me to show that he is not the same as the Father. We believe in the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he is the eternal Son of God. And that is why, because he took upon him his human nature, our human nature, without sinning ever. He is the sinless perfection of God. Amen. So he says, believe in God, believe also in me, because I am now the Son of Man that can take you to be the sons of God in the presence of the Almighty. In my Father's house are many mansions, and we explain this word from the Greek word mone, mone poleisin, mone, and here we realize it's mone. Mone means a place of abiding. Amen. It's from meno, meno, the ameno. Amen. I stay throughout eternity. Meno. So it, it, heaven is a place of permanence. It, it is irreversible. Once we get there, we'll always be there. Once saved, always saved after the rapture. But now, take care. You fight the good fight of faith. Until he comes. Amen. Amen. So the Lord says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I don't need anybody else. The word of God is sufficient. Is efficient or, or otherwise efficacious. Means that it doesn't, it, it doesn't need anybody else or something outside of itself. To support its inspiration. It's the same um, theology of God. When we say God is who he is. It means that God is not contingent. Meaning depending on anybody else to be who he is. But as of us we are contingent beings. Meaning we depend all the time on something else. Even we depend on circumstances. We depend on, uh, on the weather. We depend on the fluctuation of uh, finances and the markets. We depend on the government. We depend on each other. But God is efficacious, sufficient. El Shaddai means exactly that. He's the El Shaddai. He doesn't need anybody. He's auto-generated. He is the power. That's why we said God doesn't have power. He is the all-powerful or omnipotent God. Amen. So he says, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. How do you know? If it were not so, the Lord Jesus would have told me. How do you know there is heaven? The Lord Jesus told me. You personally? No, no, no. I'm referring to his word. I'm referring and take them there. The Lord Jesus said. Now, now you can say, thus saith the Lord. If it were not so, I would have told you. Do you know that the matter of the resurrection is something that even secular, secular his, historicists, those that study 
history, not just study, you know, it's not just history in an abstract idea, but it, it is how to do uh, the science of history, and um, they use another word, Greek word, epistemology. Epistemology is basically uh, proving that what you say is not an opinion, but it is a proven matter. So the epistemology of history is to prove, to be able, and guess what's the first thing historians or historicists do? And it's the same what they do in courts. What do they look for? Eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. And you know, the New Testament was written by eyewitnesses. Every one of them, including Jean-Marc. You know Mark, the Gospel of Mark? His name was Jean-Marc, exactly. John Mark, Ioannis Marcos. So, uh, John Mark was the, uh, was, was, uh, they are saying, some people are saying, some uh, uh, who study this, they say that he knew um, Aramaic so well that he was acting as an, in, a Greek and uh, all of the, uh, and Latin. So he was acting not only as somebody who uh, served Peter in ministry, but also uh, as somebody who was his uh, interpreter or translator. So he was used because of his knowledge, and that's why we have him also as the author of the Gospel of Mark. But anyway, the point is that all of those um, writing the New Testament, including the two ones who were not apostles, all of them, the rest are apostles except Luke and Mark. Luke with Paul and Mark uh, with Peter and Paul also and the other apostles. But the important thing, everyone was an eyewitness. And here is the challenge. If we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the whole chapter, you will find out that Paul says that if we don't believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we are of all men most miserable, most miserable. We are really uh, pitiful. But he says, we know that Christ is alive. And then he says, because he was manif he manifested himself in his resurrected state in more than 500 brethren and some of you, uh, some of them are among you now. Read it in 1 Corinthians 15. What does that mean? It means if that was wrong and the historians say this, see this, and they, uh, and they know that they have no proof of any letter from those who Paul said they saw the Lord Jesus, all of them, and he says, they live among you. None refuted that because they had seen him. They were eyewitnesses. More, more than 500 plus the apostles, plus the disciples. You know, that means they were uh, almost 600 uh, people that saw the Lord Jesus resurrected. That was a powerful truth. Anyway, beyond that, they have so many letters, letters of eyewitnesses. Now, Paul the Apostle, see the power of this. Paul the Apostle, his experience with the Lord Jesus, that he saw the resurrected Jesus also. He saw him, and he said that the Lord Jesus, who saw as a resurrected person, this story, story is only two years after the resurrection. So everything was so close to the resurrection, eyewitnesses, and they, they changed, their lives were changed. And also something that makes the Bible valid, among other many things that I referred to you many times before. But one of the things is that the lives 
of the apostles, the lives of the disciples, the lives of the believers, take the disciples and the apostles. All of the apostles died a death of a martyr. A death of a martyr. So nobody would die for a lie. You know, you can see it today. Nobody can die for a lie. Nobody, they were, you know, if they, if they say something that is untruthful, if they say and insist in something that uh, is a lie, when you threaten their lives, they will immediately, immediately give up. Because nobody dies for a lie. But somebody dies for the truth. Hallelujah. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm not worried about all of these years before. I just look forward for one thing. I want to finish. I don't, I don't want to use the, same, the, the phrase strong. I want to finish faithful that's all the success success is reaching the end success is reaching the end goal the end goal success is coming to the end of your life a thousand shall fall at your side left hand 10,000 on your right hand it shall not come nigh you besides the protection physical protection this means also people Christians are falling pastors are falling pastors are falling one after the other I don't want to be the next one I want to finish the end I want to cross the line I cannot do it Afraid, still afraid, still afraid, because we are walking on the edge of a blade. And they say, only the grace of the Lord can take us to the end. Let me close with this. First Thessalonians. Chapter 5, 23 and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God with your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Will do it. He will do it. He will do it. And because we fall, we're going to say, Lord, search me. Let us stand together. Search me.